Tonight, slavery transforms America into an economic power. And that made slaves the most valuable thing in the nation beside the land itself. Enslaved men, women, and children labor to make millions for their masters. Here you have the nation tolerating the selling of human beings. The seeds of destruction have been planted. Violence is erupting in the halls of government on the streets of Washington. It was the age of cotton, a time when a third of all southerners lived in bondage. An era of extraordinary wealth sustained by unimaginable brutality. Millions of enslaved people were bought and sold. In the Cotton Kingdom, it seemed slavery would last forever. saw two beautiful children playing together. One was a fair white child, the other was her slave. When I saw them embracing each other, I turned sadly from the lovely sight. I foresaw the blight that would fall on the slave's heart. In the 1850s, Harriet Jacobs began to pen an autobiography she would call Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. She would become the first woman to write a slave narrative. Published works written by African Americans who had escaped lives of bondage. At a time when state laws in the South made it a crime to teach the enslaved reading and writing, Harriet would use her words to reveal the awful truth of American slavery. Her story begins in the coastal town of Edenton, North Carolina, where she was born in 1813. Harriet's first owner had ignored the law and taught her to read and write. After she died, Harriet was willed to the three-year-old daughter of Dr. James Norcombe. Twelve years old, with light skin and dark eyes, Harriet became a house slave. She was to cook and clean and serve the wishes of the mistress and the master. Even the little child will learn that if God has bestowed beauty upon her, it will prove her greatest curse. Harriet Jacobs calls slavery a cage of obscene birds. Harriet says that no matter what the slave girl looks like, if she's dark, if she's light, if she's medium, if she's at all attractive, if she has beauty, it's a curse because the master will be after her. Dr. Norcom was a man widely admired in the community. He took an unmistakable interest in his new house slave, a girl 40 years his junior. The scent of sex and of oppression was overpowering in that household. It was just everywhere. And then Norcom starts to focus on her. And she doesn't know what to do. She's, she's 12. She doesn't know how to handle it. She doesn't want anything to do with him. He's a disgusting old man. Um, it's a very difficult, very difficult situation for her. He is just after her all the time. 
Uh, she could be washing the dishes, she could be making up the beds, she could be uh, setting the parlor straight, and whenever he's in a room with her, which is a lot, uh, he's just after her. My master began to whisper foul words in my ear. He peopled my young mind with unclean images, such as only a vile monster could think of. He met me at every turn, reminding me that I belonged to him, and swearing by heaven and earth that he would compel me to submit to him. She's just completely drowning in this, in this harassment and in this sexual situation. He doesn't want to force her. He wants to convince her. He wants to control her. He wants to control her mind. She says, my master had money and power on his side. I had a determined will. There is might in each. Wonderful line. So she's, she's in a war. And really from the time she's 12, 13, 14, she understands it. Because she isn't his victim. She's his enemy. Harriet knew that the doctor was the father of 11 slave children. Norcom had many children outside of his legal marriage. And what Harriet tells us that he tended to sell the children off. The practice was not unusual. Mulattoes, wrote a slaveholder's wife, are as common as blackberries. The rates of interracial children being born may have actually been higher then than any time since. Most of these liaisons cannot be described as consensual because any kind of liaison between a slave and their owner cannot be described as consensual. So no white man ever had to feel like he was in fact raping a black woman if he took her against her will. In fact, if you uh, look through the court records, you will find that the uh, judges often say there is no such thing as the rape of a black woman. The courts do not recognize it. This is just, it's disgusting. It's, it's obscene is what it is. It's obscene, it's perverted, it's incestuous. But it was normal. It was legal. The Southern Code of Honor, Harriet learned, did little to protect the virtue of black women. If a pastor has offspring by a woman not his wife, the church dismisses him. But if she's colored, it does not hinder his continuing to be their good shepherd. When Dr. Norcom joined the Episcopal Church, I was much surprised. I supposed that religion had a purifying effect on the character of men. But the worst persecutions I endured from him were after he was a communicant. If Harriet had hoped that Mary Norcom would offer protection from her husband's advances, she was sadly disappointed. Maria Norcom, as her, as her husband called her, didn't have a lot of options. She married him when she was 16. Uh, she was pregnant, I think every year and a half after that, forever. And um, she was expected to, to have those children and raise those children and run the household. For Norcom's wife, Harriet's presence was a source of unrelenting misery. What's particularly shocking, astonishing, is the figure re reappearing in ex slave narratives of the jealous mistress the mistress who cannot protect herself from her husband's adultery and who makes her own life a torture because of jealousy and because of a sense that she is not able to lift herself above her husband's lust. Meanwhile, Dr. Norcom pursues Harriet over years and years despite his wife or maybe even to spite his wife because they seem to be stuck in this triangle where everyone is um, you know they're tormenting Harriet and tormenting each other at the same time
At 15, Harriet believed she had finally found her rescuer, Samuel Treadwell Sawyer. The 30-year-old lawyer was from one of North Carolina's most important families. He says that he's concerned about her. How does she feel? Imagine you're 15 years old and a charming young man, I mean, he's not so young, he's twice as old as she is, actually. He's almost 30, comes and expresses concern. I am your friend, he says. You know where that goes. You know where that goes if you're 15 and you're white or black or brown or yellow or red and you feel you're in trouble. He was the safe haven. What was Harriet thinking when she agreed to take on a white lover? She's a teenager. That's the first thing we have to remember. She's a kid. Harriet was convinced that a man of such power and influence would be able to free her. It is a Hollywood dream more than a century before Hollywood. But it had happened to another young woman in the town, and she knew the story, and the whole town knew the story of Rose Cabarrus and how she had really managed to get her young master to fall in love with her. And he had, in fact, freed their children, and he had, in fact, freed her, and he had, in fact, even freed her mother. So there was a model for this wild alternative, and Harriet was a risk taker, and, and she took the risk. Within a year of starting her relationship with Sawyer, Harriet gave birth to a son. By law, her child was owned as she was by Norcom. As Harriet waited for Sawyer to free them, America's Protestant churches were caught up in a sweeping religious revival. Many slaveholders saw a value in exposing their slaves to Christianity. The message from the pulpit was clear. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Obey your old master and your young master. If you disobey your earthly master, you offend your heavenly master. You must obey God's commandments. Many African Americans, however, were extracting a very different message from the good book. All the stories about being brought to the promised land, being saved, I mean, that had special meaning to slaves. So that the slaves drew from Christianity the parts that particularly spoke to the oppressed, the parts that said God won't forget you, the part that said it doesn't matter what people on earth think about you, I, God, love you. On August 22nd, 1831, a small army of the oppressed rose up, and the world of Harriet Jacobs and of slaves throughout the South was forever changed. An enslaved preacher named Nat Turner led 70 slaves in an uprising in Southampton County, Virginia. In a 48-hour period, they killed 57 whites, including women and children. It is no accident that Nat Turner was a preacher. It is no accident that when he goes to war, he does so based upon commandments that he finds in the Bible, in Christianity. It was disturbing, to say the least, to slaveholders that their slaves might spout back to them Christian doctrine which would justify slave rebellion. As word of the rebellion spread across the South, whites began to lash out. In Edenton, Harriet watched in terror as every person of color became a target. Groups of white men were rushing in every direction. Wherever a colored face was to be found, everywhere, men, women, and children were whipped till the blood stood in puddles at their feet. Mobs dragged along a number of colored people, 
each white man threatening instant death if they did not stop their shrieks. And so, you know, after Nat Turner's rebellion, lots of slaves who had nothing at all to do with the rebellion suffered. Sometimes were killed. Not because they were involved in the slave rebellion, but because white people were more afraid. And when they got more afraid, they got more violent. And they were more dangerous. They had to retaliate. They had to show that, in fact, no black rebellion would or could succeed. And so they struck back. They killed blacks in the countryside. They took and cut off their heads and they put them on the roadside on stands as a, as a sign to all blacks that they uh, could not and should not rebel. The South remained on high alert. Patrols guarded roads and gathering places. Slaveholders fostered a martial atmosphere that embraced brutality as a necessity. I heard a loud noise in the heavens and the spirit instantly appeared to me and said the serpent was loosened and Christ had laid down the yoke he had borne for the sins of men and that I should take it on and fight against the serpent for the time was fast approaching when the first should be last and the last should be first forgotten until we had left the house and gone some distance when Henry and Will returned and killed it. Over the next 24 hours, Nat Turner led a small group of slaves from farm to farm, killing every white man, woman, and child they encountered. They gathered guns and more recruits during a brief but bloody revolt that spread terror throughout the slaveholding South. Nat Turner was captured and hanged. In the days before his execution, he agreed to tell his story. But after his death, his words became the property of others, as his body was during his life. His story has been continually retold since 1831. He has been depicted as a great and inspiring hero and vilified as an insane fanatic. Each author possesses Nat Turner, transforming his identity and the meaning of his revolt. Although today we cannot clearly make out the face of the man, he continues to provoke a bitter debate over the violence that he inspired. For a nation unable to come to terms with the legacy of slavery, Nat Turner remains a troublesome property. Nat Turner's slave rebellion triggered a massive mobilization of local militia and vigilante units in Virginia and neighboring North Carolina. As many as 3,000 armed men were called into action to fight what turned out to be 60 to 80 rebels. The balance of sheer military power was weighted tremendously against the slaves in this country. Slaves don't have the organization, the access to arms, the military tradition to be able to mobilize a successful insurrection. Slavery itself was such an abomination that I could see how it would drive men and women to do desperate things. Um, and 
A slave revolt by its nature to me is a pretty des desperate act. Outraged by the sight of the victims of the revolt, including many badly mutilated women and children, the militia and vigilante units engaged in a slaughter of their own. The violent, brutal reaction is meant as a warning. It's meant to frighten those who might be contemplating acts like this in the future. It's meant to demonstrate the power of white society. At least 50 and perhaps many more slaves and free blacks were summarily executed in the days after the suppression of the rebellion. There's no question that there's a cult of violence that surrounds the tension between black and white during slavery times and after. It's hard for us to, to fathom cutting off people's heads and putting them on poles, parading them around, hanging bodies up in chains, dismembering the body, taking home souvenirs. We know all about the victims, the white victims of Turner's Rebellion, who they were, where they were killed, what their names were, what their families were. Nobody knows the names of even all the participants in the Turner Rebellion, and certainly all the innocent blacks who were killed or, or, or imprisoned or, or beaten afterwards. That, this is not part of our official historical memory. That, that, that piece of the story is just uh, forgotten or suppressed and probably can never really be completely recovered. If a lot of those black people were not the property of white people, a lot more of them would be killed. Wasn't it Virginia law that said if you kill somebody's slave, the state had to reimburse them the cost of the slave or something like that? Bailiff, will you approach, please? Every rebel except Nat Turner was quickly killed or captured. During the month of September and on into October, nearly 50 accused rebels stood trial in Southampton County. Stand up. Guilty as charged. You shall be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The prisoner is guilty. The court doth value the said slave to the sum of $425. Ultimately, 19 were hanged, hanged neck, while others were transported and sold outside the boundaries of the state. The court recommends to the governor that the punishment be commuted to transportation. For Harriet Jacobs, life under Norcom's grip would become intolerable and far more complicated. At 19, she gave birth to another child by Sawyer, a daughter. Sawyer offered to buy the children. Norcom not only refused, he wanted revenge. Norcom is threatening to send her children to a plantation of his that's known for brutalizing slaves. Uh, Harriet uses the word brutalizing, what we, that's what we would call traumatizing. And when she speaks of what happens to people, their, their hearts get broken, their psyches get broken. They're not themselves afterwards. Slowly, the realization came. If she were gone, Norcom would relinquish the children. The only way to save her children was to leave them. And so she decides she has to act to free them. It's, it's a wild move, but she made wild moves before. In 1835, Harriet fled into nearby swamps until her grandmother, a free woman living in Edenton, arranged for a more permanent hideout. Soon after, Harriet was secreted away in a tiny space beneath the roof of her grandmother's house. Harriet's world would now shrink to a space nine feet long, seven feet wide, and three feet high. If you take a very large library table and get under the library table, that's the kind of space that you're talking about. Rats and 
Mice ran over my bed. I was restless for want of air. The atmosphere was so stifled that even mosquitoes would not condescend to buzz in it. I suffered for air even more than for light. She suffers from heat, she suffers from cold. From time to time, she can come down and walk around a little bit. But she's, she's under house arrest, basically. She was literally a prisoner who, who made herself a prisoner, and I guess that's how she did it. She survived as prisoners do. Within weeks, Harriet learned that Sawyer had bought the children and was sending them to live at her grandmother's house. Still, Harriet continued to live a secret existence, just a floor apart from her children. The thing that holds her back is her devotion to her children. And that was, for a lot of slave women, the thing that kept them from running away. There were a great deal more male runaways, and the typical runaway was a young male who didn't have children. For slave women, they just didn't want to run away without their children. Days slipped into months, months into years. Harriet filled her time writing, reading, and sewing. She describes some psychotic episodes. She talks about uh, hearing voices, and she talks about seeing things, and she talks about uh, passing out, and um, they have to bring her to. She bore a tiny hole through one of the walls. On occasion, she could catch a glimpse of her children playing nearby, comforting herself in the knowledge that she had freed them from Norcom's hold. Countless were the nights that I sat late at the little loophole, scarcely large enough to give me a glimpse of one twinkling star. Season after season, year after year, I peeped at my children's faces and heard their sweet voices with a heart yearning all the while to say, your mother is here. I think that her psychic strength reflects that of all slave women because slavery demanded a different kind of womanhood. It demanded that people be self-reliant. It demanded that they try to do everything that they could to protect themselves. But she has the strength and resilience that African-American women had to develop to survive slavery. Decades before Harriet Jacobs was born, leading Southerners such as George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had been convinced that slavery was nearing its end. Tobacco had exhausted the soil. The need for slave labor had diminished. That changed in 1803 when President Jefferson signed the Louisiana Purchase and doubled the size of the nation. Four new states, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas, together known as the Deep South, joined the Union as slave states. Thomas Jefferson, in negotiating of the Louisiana Purchase, declared it he was going to create an empire for liberty. He was going to make an area in which American liberty would expand across the continent. Thomas Jefferson's empire for liberty turned out to be an empire for slavery. The 19th century, the years after the Louisiana Purchase, were the period of the greatest expansion of American slavery ever. The new land was an ideal match for a new invention, the cotton gin. The combination of the cotton gin and the Louisiana Purchase made the production of cotton unbelievably profitable. You know, the cotton gin increased the amount of cotton that a single slave could produce in a day 
by 50-fold. What it meant was that growing cotton was incredibly, incredibly profitable. In 1808, just as cotton was creating an insatiable appetite for slave labor, Congress abolished the importation of slaves from Africa. Now an already vibrant domestic slave trade would flourish. In the Upper South, the sale of slaves became more profitable than growing tobacco. Slaves vary wildly in value from $50 to $2,000, depending on who, you know, who they are, how old they are, but the valuable ones are very, very valuable. The slave trade develops its own language. It's the language of, of big bucks. Uh, it's a language of wenches. Of course, uh, this entire language is meant to separate the black people uh, from the common run of humanity. It's a language of dehumanization. It's a language of bestiality uh, to say uh, that these uh, people are, in fact, like animals. Slave auctions became a common sight, even in the nation's capital. I got a hundred dollars bid. Thank you, sir. Count anyone on have hands all over the ground here. Heard party. Two hundred. Who'll do that? If a young woman was put on the auction block. One of the things that they wanted to make sure she could do was have children. They touched people's bodies, both men and women. But you can imagine that for a woman, it was incredibly invasive. So they were not above taking her into a back room and examining her to see whether or not she was able to have children. Now, this is the 19th century, so one wonders what an ordinary slaveholder would be doing. But they, even on the auction block, they would feel a woman's breast to see whether or not she could suckle a child. The specter of the auction block haunted the lives of enslaved people. Slave mothers knew that this moment might come and they anticipated it and they did everything they could to prevent it, they lobbied with their masters. They tried to get sold with their children. But it was something that haunted them from the moment that their children were born, that they might lose them. More than a million people would be sent to the Deep South. Nearly twice as many as were brought to America in all the years of the African slave trade. Many of the enslaved were compelled to march the entire distance. Some as much as a thousand miles. To one observer, the procession of chained slaves resembled nothing so much as a funeral march. And it took everything they had to keep going. And we also need to remember that some people didn't make it. Some people were depressed, some people were suicidal, some people were vengeful and violent with each other or toward animals or toward children. There was a lot of loss. There was a lot of loss. While slavery was expanding in the South, the northern states were abolishing it, staking their future on free labor. The nation was becoming two separate societies. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 was designed to maintain a balance of free and slave states. Yet, the cotton juggernaut would be unstoppable. Cotton becomes the key crop, the key cash producer in the life of a nation for a period of time there are more millionaires along a narrow band of land along the Mississippi River than in the entire rest of the nation combined. This is, this is a terribly, terribly profitable crop that we're talking about. By 1840, the value of cotton exports 
was greater than everything else the nation exported to the world combined. And that made slaves the most valuable thing in the nation beside the land itself. As the price of slaves soared, slave traders began to roam the north, abducting free black people. In April of 1841, Solomon Northup found himself in one of the many slave pens lining the streets of Washington, D.C. Born a free man, he lived in New York State with his wife and three children. The idea began to break upon my mind that I had been kidnapped, but that I thought was incredible. It could not be that a free citizen of New York should be dealt with thus inhumanly. It was a desolate thought. I bowed my head and wept. He was a free person. He knew he was a free person. And so here he is in a situation where it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The color of your skin marks you as a potential slave. In Washington, D.C., slave auctions were a daily occurrence. Chained human beings were marched routinely in front of the Capitol. If you can picture Solomon Northup, a free man who has lived a good portion of his life in New York State, and he sees himself in chains being taken away to slavery, think about the contradiction. Here you have the federal capital of the United States, the nation dedicated to the proposition of human freedom, tolerating, profiting from the selling of human beings into bondage. At the age of 33, Solomon Northup was sold down the river, as the phrase went, transported down the Mississippi to the cotton fields of the Deep South. Lewis Hughes was also sold down the river. At 11 years old, he was bought in Virginia for $380. I can still see my mother's face when she bade me goodbye. I ran off from her as quickly as I could, for I did not want her to see me crying. It came to me more and more plainly that I would never see her again. Lewis arrived at the plantation of Mr. Edward McGee. His new owner was one of the wealthiest planters in Mississippi. When I went out into the yard, everywhere I looked, slaves met my view. I never saw so many slaves at one time before. The young boy was presented as a gift to Mrs. McGee and put to work around the main house. Alone and helpless, he worked hard at his tasks. But it was of no use. Mrs. McGee was naturally irritable. I tried to please her by arranging the parlor when I overheard her say, they soon get spirit. It don't do to praise them. My heart sank within me. So, Lewis Hughes speaks of his mistress as someone who would simply hit him as he walked by or cuff his ears when he was simply, he thought, going about his business. One of the saddest sides of this story is that over and over again, the children don't understand why they're being beaten. What is the motive? What am I being corrected for? What is it that I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing? You can imagine what this does psychologically if you don't know why 
you're being beaten. Louis Hughes's mistress becomes for him an example of the way that slavery corrupts the character of white people. He looks at her and how she takes out her bad feelings on the slaves on a daily basis and thinks this is, you know, this, this institution is actually bad for white people. It makes them into terrible people. In the Cotton Kingdom, slaveholders saw themselves as members of a new aristocracy. They built lavish homes, bought the finest furnishings, and prided themselves on the elegance of their manners. Their leisure was purchased by the back-breaking labor of others. At harvest time, young Lewis was sent to the fields. The daily task of each able-bodied slave during the cotton picking season was 250 pounds or more. And all those who did not come up to the required amount would get a whipping. Enslaved people labored from sunup to sundown, and when the moon was full, they continued into the night. Children as young as nine picked cotton. And now we had to start thinking about people, as slaveholders thought about people, and that is as machines. You have to keep your machines working at top speed for as long as possible. Having made their fortunes in the Deep South, planters turned their attention to gaining political power, becoming governors, congressmen, senators, and presidents. Cotton and the slave labor force which made the production of cotton possible was incredibly powerful economically. And in the 19th century, as in the 21st century, economic power translated into political power. In the 72 years between the election of George Washington and the election of Abraham Lincoln, 50 of those years sees a slave holder in the White House. It is uh, they uh, who write uh, the laws. It is they who adjudicate uh, those uh, laws. It is they who enforce the, those laws. Uh, the United States is truly a slaveholding republic. Though they had abandoned slave labor in their own region, northerners were making huge profits from slavery. Cotton generated an extensive textile industry in New England. Insurance companies insured slaves as property. Many Wall Street firms got their start as middlemen in the cotton trade. Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts called it a conspiracy of the Lords of the Loom and the Lords of the Lash. The economics of slavery had torn Lewis Hughes from his family. Now he would find another. People grab other people and they make blood kin out of people who are not kin. It's resilience, it's, it's survival, it's a way to survive. It's a way to make a way out of no way, to create a family when it is being torn and split apart. It saved people who were vulnerable in so many ways to physical and psychological abuse. Someone else in the quarters or in the kitchen who says, here's a little cake for you, or how are you, or help me. These are the other sides of these, not blood relationships, but kin relationships nonetheless. Lewis Hughes would grow strong and healthy. The thought of freedom never far away. I used to hear Boss read in the papers about runaway slaves who had gone to Canada, and it always made me long to go. Yet I never appeared as if I paid the slightest attention to what the family read or said on such matters. But I felt that I could try at least to get away. When he was 20 years old, Lewis summoned the courage and fled, only to be caught and returned. My clothing was removed and the whipping began. Ah. 
boss whipped me a while. Then he sat down and read his paper. After which, the whipping resumed. This continued for two hours. Then he used tree switches, which cracked the flesh so the blood oozed out. It was weeks before I could bear clothing touching my skin. Whippings often ended with a bucket of salt water poured on the wounds. In 1842, Harriet Jacobs had lived in her cramped, dark space for almost seven years. It appeared to me as if ages had rolled away since I entered upon that gloomy, monotonous existence. My friends feared I should become a cripple. Had it not been for the hope of serving my children, I should have been thankful to die. Dark thoughts passed through my mind as I lay there day after day. I tried to be grateful for my little cell, and even to love it as part of the price I had paid for the redemption of my children. Why, for seven years, almost, six years and 11 months, she can't leave? I must say, I don't understand. And, and researching her life, researching her biography, her autobiography, I, I didn't really, at the beginning, believe the seven years. But in fact, we know when she went into hiding, because we have Norcom's ad in the paper uh, saying uh, he's after his fugitive girl, Harriet, who absconded for no reason. Now, after all those years of confinement, Harriet's secret was about to be exposed. A neighbor's untrustworthy slave had stumbled upon Harriet's hideaway. A ship captain known for smuggling runaways, offered to help. Off the coast of Edenton, arrangements were made for Harriet's escape. I was on deck as soon as the day dawned. I watched the reddening sky and saw the great orb come up slowly out of the water. Soon the waves began to sparkle and everything caught the beautiful glow. I had never realized what grand things air and sunlight are till I had been deprived of them. Harriet arrived in the bustling city of Philadelphia. There she was met by members of the Underground Railroad, an anti-slavery network dedicated to helping runaway slaves. There were more than a half million free blacks in the North. Many of them, like Harriet, had left loved ones behind in the South. Harriet's hope was to find her brother, John, who had fled Edenton years earlier. She boarded a train to New York and got her first taste of racial attitudes in the North. We were stowed away in a large, rough car with windows on each side too high for us to look out without standing up. This was the first chill to my enthusiasm about the free states. What she encountered was a world uh, very divided by race, in which black people were second or third class citizens, actually, um, in which uh, black men could not vote, unlike white men. So it's, um, it's a hierarchical, white supremacist world that she encounters in the North. When she found her brother, he was working as an anti-slavery speaker, on occasion sharing a podium with Frederick Douglass. Also a fugitive slave, Douglass was one of the most powerful voices for black freedom in the country. African Americans, together with white abolitionists, were building a growing anti-slavery movement. In 1849, Harriet moved to Rochester, New York, a hub of abolitionist activity. She follows her brother west to Rochester 
And uh, there she meets um, the most militant group of women on the North American continent. She meets the women who have just, in 1848, uh, uh, had the first convention of women's rights at Seneca Falls. And she becomes a very close friend of the Quaker feminist abolitionist Amy Post. And it's to Amy Post that Harriet finally tells her story. And a few years later, um, Amy convinces Harriet to write her story as a contribution to the movement. America would have ignored the contradiction of a freedom-loving nation tolerating slavery if they could have. But what free blacks, what slaves, what they did in conjunction with white allies who were committed to anti-slavery was to make it increasingly difficult for the nation to ignore this great glaring contradiction. The anti-slavery message struck a nerve among many northerners as a massive influx of immigrants began putting new strains on their society. The Irish wage laborers who built those railroads who dug the canals were the first real wage labor working class in America. And the growth of that working class is going to become a major social development of 19th century America. But there was this notion that slave labor and free labor could not exist side by side. That slave labor would drive out would devalue free labor. With victory in the Mexican War bringing vast new territories into the Union, the conflict between slave states and free states would explode. The South wanted room to grow. The North saw a promised land for free labor. As violent confrontation loomed in the West, Congress devised the Compromise of 1850. California would be admitted as a free state, and in return, the South would get the most severe fugitive slave law in the nation's history. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, you have to understand what this law said. It said that a person could be accused of being a fugitive slave, and that person would have no right of self-defense, no right to speak on his or her own behalf. No right to a lawyer, no right to a jury trial. Think about it. The law was a resounding defeat for abolitionists. Local officials would receive the hefty sum of ten dollars for every African-American handed over to slave catchers. It is the beginning of a reign of terror to the colored population, Harriet declared. As danger mounted, scores of Harriet's friends and neighbors fled to Canada. Many a wife discovered a secret she had never known before, that her husband was a fugitive and must leave her to ensure his own safety. Worse still, many a husband discovered that his wife had fled from slavery years ago and as the child follows the condition of the mother, the children of his love were liable to be seized and carried into slavery. As the Cotton Kingdom reached new heights of wealth and power, Lewis Hughes married Matilda, a cook on the McGee plantation. Soon after, she gave birth to twins. But motherhood did not spare Matilda from overwork. Mrs. McGee's demands were unrelenting, forcing Matilda to neglect her babies. My heart was sore and heavy, for my wife was almost run to death with work. My blood boiled in my veins to see my wife so abused. Yet I dare not open my mouth. Within six months, the twins were dead. 
Well, it's a heartbreaking situation, and what makes it even worse is that you realize that every slaveholding household in the nation had this kind of a scene sooner or later. We have babies dying like crazy. It's, we call it infant mortality. That's a very clinical word for babies dying. For the young couple, there seemed no end to suffering. Nearly 250 years after Africans were first landed on America's shores, the Supreme Court of the United States would proclaim that blacks, by virtue of their race, were not persons before the law. In 1857, in a landmark decision, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dred Scott case that Congress had no authority to limit the spread of slavery to any territory. The Chief Justice's words stunned African Americans. Roger B. Tawney, a Southerner, reads a decision that says that Dred Scott as a black person and black people generally had never been, were not then, could never be citizens of the United States and as such have no rights which white men are bound to respect. Northerners were furious. Wherever our flag floats, protested one newspaper editor, it is the flag of slavery. When abolitionists sought ways to circumvent the Dred Scott ruling, slaveholders pressed for a federal slave law. This is astounding. By the late 1850s, the Southerners are demanding that the federal government pass a slave code for all the territories that it acquired in the West. And, and obviously, Northerners aren't about to accept this kind of thing. The battle over slavery was crippling the political process. On a bright spring morning, Congressman Preston Brooks from South Carolina entered the Senate chamber and beat Senator Charles Sumner, the fiery abolitionist, into unconsciousness. Violence is erupting in the halls of government, on the streets of Washington, involving our lawmakers. There are people who are coming to sessions of the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate armed. In fact, one letter says the only people who aren't coming with two guns are those who are coming with two guns and a knife. In the midst of the partisan turmoil, all eyes turned to the 1860 presidential election and the Republican nominee, the Free Soil candidate, Abraham Lincoln. Both Edward McGee and Lewis Hughes anxiously awaited the results. Boss had been reading the papers when he broke out with the exclamation, the very idea of electing an old rail splitter to the presidency of the United States. Well, he'll never take his seat. The Democratic Party had fractured North and South, giving victory to the rail splitter from Illinois. The first time a candidate was elected without carrying a single Southern state. Remember, Lincoln was elected committed to not interfering with slavery anywhere. He was only committed to restricting its expansion. But at that point, the slaveholders had become so convinced that the North was taken over by these lunatic abolitionists that that is the way they viewed Abraham Lincoln's election, no matter what Lincoln said. Even before Lincoln took office, seven southern states withdrew from the Union. Enslaved people across the South were heartened by the news. For Lewis and Matilda, the moment held the first ray of hope for freedom. After reuniting with her children, Harriet Jacobs completed her autobiography. As she looked toward an uncertain future, her brother's words weighed heavy on her heart. 
Woe be to the country where the son of liberty has to rise up out of the sea of blood. The United States had come apart over slavery. The nation was at the brink of civil war. Hey, 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 hey,